National Broadcasting Company presents Eyes Aloft. Army Flash. One, multi-motor, high, scene, 15, Lucy, four, overhead, southeast. Eyes aloft, watching the sky, watching for planes, flying the lanes up above. Eyes aloft, eyes aloft. Fourth Fighter Command of the United States Army Air Forces, in cooperation with the West Coast radio stations, presents this new series of Monday evening programs honoring the 150,000 volunteer observers and builder center workers whose round-the-clock vigilance keeps watchful guard of the Pacific Coast against attack by enemy planes. Eyes alone, night and day. Carpenter speaking. Tonight, we bring you a gala second edition of Eyes Aloft. You'll hear the weekly presentation of the handsome Eyes Aloft Gold Trophy Award. Dramatized true stories about observation posts and filter centers. The orchestra and sportsman quartet will do a full arrangement of the lilting new Eyes Aloft theme song, which was written by Gordon Jenkins. And you'll hear from one of the fourth fighter commands, most famous observers, motion picture star Henry Fonda. Here now, your Eyes Aloft narrator, the well-known radio, motion picture, and newsreel commentator, Jane Whitman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Do you like mystery yarns? Well, our first true story tonight comes from the state of Washington. We have titled it, The Strange Case of the Capitol Dome. The gray granite dome of the Capitol building in Olympia, Washington, rises 280 feet above the grounds below. Within the crown of the dome is a stone-pillared cupola. The cupola is open to the weather. In winter, icy gales drive constantly about the tower of this monument to government. Inside of the dark dome and leading up to the cupola is a winding spiral staircase of steel. On last January 13th, a man and a woman bundled in heavy clothing laboriously climbed the spiral steps. 176. 177. Achoo! Remember, you're catching cold. Go on, Phil. Go on. We're nearly at the top. 178. 179. 180. Phil, you sneezed. No, I didn't. Something just tickled my nose. Of all the places to have a lookout post. Well, go on. I gotta rest a second. Now, the country is one thing, and the army is another. But people won't keep on coming up here in the top of this dome to catch their death of pneumonia. Well, somebody has to keep these watches. Go on, we're right here at the top almost. 181, 182. Well, here we are at the top. Open the door. Yeah. Oh. Step out, Melvin. Yeah. Come on. People on duty up here can't even hear us on account of the wind. Well, I'm sick of this whole useless thing. What do we do up here? Telephone to somebody about a lot of silly planes flying around in the skies. Mildred. Oh, I didn't mean that. But if a few more people would only help keep the watches. Yeah. Too few are doing too much. Well, don't try to take bows for what we're doing, Phil. Gosh, it's cold up here. Mm -hmm. Oh, there they are. Come on. Well, we got here. You are about five minutes early. Well, it's windy, isn't it, Mr. Hedberg? Good thing there's a railing. We'd get blown off. How are you tonight, Mrs. Travers? I'll tell you one thing, Mr. Hedberg. <laughs> Excuse me. I know some women can't climb those 182 steps up here, and some shouldn't be trying it. You've got to move this observation poster, or it's going to fail. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right. Carl Hedberg, service manager for Talcott Brothers, oldest jewelry store in the state of Washington, is the chief observer in Olympia. He knew after 60 days that the post was failing, would fail completely if it weren't moved from the Capitol Dome. On the 1st of February, Carl Hedberg started promoting. He went to Thad Pierce, manager of one of Olympia's leading hotels. 
Fad, uh, your hotel here is six stories high. There's a good view from your roof. Sure. What are you getting at, Carl? I want to build a little observation shack up on your roof. Oh. Well, you see, Carl... And I, I want to start construction right away. It's for the protection of the community, you know. I know, but I'm afraid my insurance rate would jump if I open my roof to traffic. You want to check on that point, Fad? Well, sure I will, right away. And if the rate doesn't increase, can we build our observation post up there? Why, certainly. Only too glad to cooperate. Certainly. Good. <laughs> Say, if you're that willing to cooperate, Pat, I might give you the honor of taking over a regular observer's watch. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Carl Hedberg called on the Nyack Lumber Company and the Washington Veneer Company. Presented his problem. Those two companies willingly donated the lumber for the little shack. And the Carpenters Union agreed to supply free labor to build it. But one obstacle remained. The lumber had to be raised to the roof of the hotel. Carl Hedberg presented this problem to one of his most reliable and cooperative observers, local police judge Ray Ostrander. Well, why don't we do it ourselves, Carl? Well, I guess that's one way to get it done. You know anything about hauling lumber up to the top of a six-story hotel roof? Oh, gosh, no, Ray. I'm, I'm a jeweler. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess first we need some ropes, you know, block and tackle. Mm -hmm. I wonder where I can go to borrow stuff like that. I'll get it somewhere. You've been putting in enough of your time on this job without any too much help either. Uh, how about borrowing our block and tackle from Western Heating Company? Mm -hmm. Mr. Haskett's a city commissioner. He can't very well turn us down on a deal like ours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Say, when will we do this lumber hoisting job, Carl? Mm, how about tonight? This is Saturday. Going anyplace, Ray? Well, no, nowhere I can't cancel. This is important. I can meet you in the alley back of the hotel at nine tonight. How's that? All right. We're all closed. Sure. Say, uh, suppose we need a city permit to do a job like that? Well, let's do it. Find out later. <laughs> I'll go and route up the tackle now. Yeah, the lumber will be delivered this afternoon. Yeah, well, see you tonight at nine. In the alley, Carl. Okay, Ray. At nine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad we don't have a light to see what we're doing, huh? Yeah, maybe it's a good thing. There'll be a lot of people come to ask questions. Say, I feel like a second story man. You look like one. <laughs> there. I think that load's tied together tight now. Well, I hope so. I'll go on back up to the roof now, Ray. <laughs> Say, this is kind of fun, isn't it, Ray? Well, uh, I've spent less entertaining Saturday night. Go on, get up on the roof. We'll haul our first load up. Okay. Uh, give me five minutes. I know. <laughs> up there, Carl. Better come. I'll haul. You handle the guideline. Here we go. Yep. Here comes the first load. Ray, you yeah. better take a seat for a minute. I'm not tired. I mean, I think there's something wrong with the load. What's wrong with it? I can't see. The lumber's loose or else it's there. Hey, right, look out. Uh, the load's come loose. What? Come on, get out of the way. I, think I can't hear what you're oh. saying. Yeah, I'm all right. You didn't get hit? No. Don't look now, but we just broke the back window to Kepner's Floral Company. <laughs> hey, somebody's coming. <laughs> hey, what's going on down this house? What's it to you? Oh, Robert, break your window, huh? Oh, what's going on down there, right? We've been apprehended. Shall I stay here and let the police take me, or shall I run and hide? <laughs> here they come, man. <laughs> All right, buddy, we got you. Okay, okay, you got me. What are you going to do with me? They're breaking out alley store windows, are you? <laughs> Looks like it. What's going on down there? Well, no, it's police. They aren't senators, Ray. Sergeant, he's got an accomplice up on the roof of the hotel. Hey, what kind of a job are you guys trying to pull? And quit laughing. I can't. I'm too embarrassed. I feel like a schoolboy caught in the jam. Come on, come on. Let's get over to the state and you can tell the judge all about it. You mind if I call the Jimmy Valentine up there on the roof? Well, hurry it up. Hey, 
Hey, Carl, yeah. drop over to the police station later and see how you like me behind bars. Wait, wait for me. I'll be right now. Hey, wait a minute. Have you got a flashlight, Sergeant? I just went out and got it out of the car. Give it here a minute. Yeah, sure. Here. Turn this thing on and see what this man looks like. There. Hey. Hello, officer. Judge Ostrander. Nice night for a murder, eh, boys? Oh, but, uh... What are you doing back here in this dark alley? Hey, what's all this pile of lumber and junk? Well, boys, Carl Hedberg and I are just trying to do a little something for the community, and so far we've kind of messed it up. Oh, we'll pay for the broken window. Now, look, officers, I think I can explain everything. Let's just keep this one off the record, shall we? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Through the efforts of Chief Observer Carl Hedberg, Ray Ostrander, and a few others like him, the observation post was built atop the hotel. It is accessible and comfortable. 115 observers report regularly as three captains, Ray Ostrander, Ernest Miner, and Harland Graver, keep the crews flowing evenly. But had the post been left in the dome of the Capitol building, it no doubt would have been destined to utter failure. Tonight, we pay tribute to Carl Hedberg for being a wise and energetic chief observer. We salute all who have made observation post Olympia 57 an outstanding success. Although Eyes Aloft made its initial appearance on the airlines last Monday night, already we've had a great many inquiries about our theme song. It's a stirring song written especially for the 4th Fighter Command's Aircraft Warning Service by one of America's most successful writers of hits, Gordon Jenkins, who is also our orchestra conductor. Now, because so many have asked to hear it in its entirety, Gordon Jenkins and the sportsmen present a special arrangement of Eyes Aloft. And two of five sea was once a sentinel cry. But a modern 20th century Paul Revere must watch the sky. Eyes aloft, night and day, will help protect the USA. And two if I see was once a sentinel's cry But a modern 20th century Paul Revere must watch the sky Eyes aloft, night and day will help protect the USA Situated in the geographical center of the Pacific Coast area in Coos County, Oregon, is the tiny little town of McKinley. We feel that there's something about McKinley Post and the people of McKinley community that is typical of the spirit of the Ground Observer Corps. A gravel road winds through a beautiful and tight little mountain valley. In a forest-clad hollow, little more than half a mile wide, is McKinley. The post is a little frame building standing beneath a large old cherry tree. John O'Sullivan is chief observer. There in the heart of the little community today stands a typical observation post, carrying on 24 hours a day, though very few planes are ever reported. On April 30th, someone brought a notebook and left it at the post. The book became the diary of the watchers. The things that are written in it are beautiful, sincere, inspiring, truly patriotic. Each week, we will read some brief entry made by a McKinley Post observer in this diary. Let's see. This is the way the little book begins. An off-the-record diary of McKinley Observation Post, beginning April 30th, 1942, and ending who knows when. Down those Japs. Page one. A very sad beginning to our diary. Just heard that one of our most faithful observers lost two fingers in a mill accident. Our sympathy to you, Howard Cock. We turn to another entry a few days later. 
I am so glad to be a member of this little post and thank everyone for their kindness during our misfortune. Howard is doing nicely now. I am watching from 9 p.m. until 3 a.m. Hope the Japs don't come tonight. Lucille Cole. And one more entry. Monday, May 11th, 1942. At 11 p.m., my son Forrest woke me and got into bed. As I got up, I called his attention to the strange light in the north and northeast. The Aurora Borealis. At 11.30, the electric power failed. I wrapped myself in a blanket and prepared for a night in the dark. The light in the north increased. At, At midnight... I easily could see the clock hands when I turned the face of the clock toward the east window. A cold electric heater reflected a spot of light. The star Vega in Lyra seemed to twinkle faster than I ever noticed before. At 12.26, the electric light came on and the heater soon warmed my feet. I returned to reading the adventures of the Albi family in Yukon as described in the May National Geographic magazine. At 1 a.m., the sky became cloudy, stars being obscured. Now, 4 a.m., a gentle rain on the roof. Here is a little poem I've written while sitting here tonight. When once more the dove of peace shall quiet the thundering guns of death, and we hear the songs of gladness pouring out in every breath, you will gain much satisfaction from belonging to the hosts of courageous men and women at our observation posts. Signed, T.S. Easton. Now, here is Ken Carpenter to chat for a few minutes with one of the most famous observers in the aircraft warning service. Star of the screen and observer at Brentwood, California Post... Henry Fonda. Well, uh, Hank, how do you find time to make all the pictures you do and still serve as an observer? Well, how does a farmer find time to do all his work and still serve as an observer, Ken? Well, I see what you mean. You know, I think more people should be contributing their services to this fine volunteer civilian work. Yes. Too few are doing too much. Of course, I think maybe a lot of people don't know about the Ground Observer Corps. Well, it's about time some of them find out and offer to share the work. I think it's an American privilege to be a Ground Observer, Ken. Uh, when did you start? Oh, sometime in the latter part of last December. <laughs> You've been at it almost from the beginning, then. I remember I started on Christmas Eve. Oh, no? and I suppose you missed having Christmas tree with your family. No, this year we postponed our tree till Christmas morning so I could handle my watch. You know, Ken, they nailed me to handle a New Year's Eve shift, too. <laughs> they really give you the big holidays, don't they? Uh, it's okay with me. I'm not a nightclub boy. The farmers always watch the old year out right in their own home. Only this year, you were at the O.P. Say, about how many planes a month does your Brentwood Post report? Well, I don't know how many a month, but during the day when the women are on watch, they report as many as 100 an hour. 100 an hour? Man, they must keep those lines to the filter center hot. Of course, I usually take the night shift, midnight to 4 a.m. I'm sort of like some of the folks up in Northern California. Back in the hills, I don't get to report many planes. Well, uh, do you know about how many you have reported in the seven or eight months you've been on the job? Yeah, about four. four. But an Army officer once told me it's just as important to the system to turn in no reports as to turn in any. Well, how do you mean? Well, I mean what counts is having somebody there on duty to make a report if a plane is sighted. Well, gosh, Henry, if you serve from midnight to 4 a.m. and picture people have to be on the set at 5 or 6 in the morning, you don't get much sleep the night you watch. No. Oh. No, I usually just stop by home, have a cup of coffee, and then get right out to the studio. Uh, just one more thing before we wind this up, Hank. Uh, what do you think most important to the operation of a successful post? Most important? Uh, I mean, what pitfalls should observers watch for in this work? Well, there's one thing that really burns me up. Well, what's that? The observer who won't take the trouble to learn how to call in a concise, accurate report of a plane. Are there different ways to call in a report? Certainly, a right and a wrong way. And if an observer calls in a garbled report, it, it sure confuses the poor girls on the shoulder boards. A report should be called in exactly according to the Army form. It's very important those reports are made right. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a word of the wise is sufficient. Say, you're really all steamed up about this Ground Observer Corps work, aren't you, Hank? Uh, I think it's one of the most useful and vital volunteer jobs any civilian can do these days. 
I've been hounding my chief observer, Charlie Dye, to give me more shift. That's the way I feel about it. Well, thank you, Henry Fonda, for coming to our program today. It was a pleasure, Ken. And remember, folks, eyes aloft. Our last true life story today comes from the little community of Roosevelt, California, on the edge of the Mojave Desert. The Roosevelt Post has had a colorful career, but one with plenty of headaches and heartaches. And for all its trouble, it has maintained a high efficiency rating of nearly 99%. At first, the post was located in George and Billy Zazana's service station at the Roosevelt Crossroads. But after a few months, a change had to be made. The Zazanas talked it over with Chief Observer John Holdren and Ralph Austin and Alvis Williams one evening. We can't go on leaving our little service station open night and day, John. Well, I don't blame you, George. You see, our place is getting to be a 24-hour-a-day hangout. Transients coming through at night see the only light in town and they hang around here. Well, I think we ought to build a little shack right across the street. On the corner. You know, uh, good idea come to me this afternoon. What's that, Ralph? Well, I knew we was going to have to move the post out of your service station here. So I got me the idea that maybe we could get an old sedan auto body and make it into a post. Hey, that's not a bad idea, Ralph. You mean, you mean just take the wheels off and set her up on blocks over there on the corner? This auto body I got in mind don't have any wheels on it. <laughs> well, whose car is it? <laughs> well, I went into Lancaster and I did a little chiseling this afternoon. Mm -hmm. What kind of chiseling? I went to Clark's junkyard and I told him what we needed and what it was for. Clark said if we'd come and get it, we could have an old Model A Ford sedan body he's got laying there. Hey, well, good for you, Ralph. Of course, it's a rusty old job. <laughs> well, I got a spray gun. I'll get some paint, and we'll paint it up pretty. <laughs> Billy, what's your favorite color? <laughs> well, you know me, Elvis. I like green. Okay, we'll paint it green. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I figure we can rip out the front seat and build a shelf for the phone. You know, people can sit comfortable in the back seat just like they were going somewhere. <laughs> you know, George, I think we should have them hook the post telephone right in our line here at the service station. You mean when it rings in the post, it'll ring here, too? Sure. And if for some reason somebody can't show up for a shift, I can take the call here. Help out all we can to keep this thing running smooth for the Army. Yeah, that's right. Good idea. The donated sedan body was mounted on a foundation there at the corner of the Roosevelt Crossroads. The body was painted a bright green. Telephone, lights, heater, magazines were installed. It was perhaps one of the most novel posts on the Pacific coast. And then, an incident happened that aroused the sympathy of the entire community. Henry Nosick, one of the observers, has had a ranch near Roosevelt for years, has reared his family in the community. Henry Nosick was born in Russia some 50 years ago. One night, when Henry Nosick was on duty, a plane flew over, and Henry tried to report it. I got to report. I got to report. Now, how do I do? I ring the telephone ground handle. Ah, I wait. Army, go ahead, please. Yeah, now I say, Army, flash... One aeroplane? You'll have to speak more plainly, please. I say, one aeroplane overhead flying? I'm sorry, sir. I, I can't understand you. Oh, I am Russian. I talk the best I can. I, I try again. You, you listen good. One single motor, low, shin. What? Shin, shin. I, I, I see it. It is so low. Is there anyone else there who can place the report? Uh, I go across street, get girl over there, call goodbye. I am sorry. Do I talk so bad people can't understand me? I go over see Billy across the street. One. Single motor. Low. Seen. 36 Ralph. Northwest. Oh, there you are, Mr. Nasik. They don't understand me on the phone. What will I do, Billy? Well, when you call, talk slowly, Mr. Nasik. Speak as clearly as you can. I do all that. That girl at that filter tent, and maybe she don't hear so oh, good. Now, now, Mr. Nasik. We have no idea how busy they are. Well, they're taking hundreds of calls an hour. 
They're on the edge. They, they have so much responsibility. They have a nerve-wracking job to do. Some people don't have patience with foreigners. You aren't a foreigner, Mr. Nosek. You're an American. Ah, sure. I am American. I have my citizenship papers a long time, but I can't help. I speak with a Russian accent, but I can't help even if I try so hard. Now, you mustn't worry. You go on back to your post and watch for planes. Next time you call in a report, speak just as distinctly as you can. All right. I, I try again, Billy. This job I want to do for my country so much, I want to help like other people in town here. Two weeks later, and after Mr. Nosick had served several other watchers, a request came from Filter Center that Mr. Nosick be relieved of his job as a watcher. When Mr. Nosick was told by the chief observer, he was stunned. He went back and talked to his friend, Billy Zarzana. They, they don't want me, Billy. I heard this morning. Oh, I'm so sorry. Listen to me talk, Billy. Can you understand me? Now you listen. I speak for you. Army flash, one, multi-motor, high. You understand me, Billy? Yes, Mr. Nosick, but maybe over our poor telephone and... It isn't easy for some people to hear real well. I want to be observer, Billy. Oh, I know, Mr. Nosek. Give me but... my wife. She go out and work in Hayfield like man the days I come to be observer. You know my boy Alex. Isn't he in American Army for two years? Yes, Mr. Nosek. Uh, now, now, don't get upset, please. My younger boy, Stanley. Stanley, he says he's going to enlist soon now. He's 21. Everybody do something to help, but... But they won't let me. Wait, Mr. Nosek. <laughs> I think maybe you can help. I can't? How, Billy? Tell me how. We'll work it out together. Together? Yes. I'll arrange in the future so that when you're on watch, I'll always be here at the service station. Yeah. When you see a plane, you just run over and let me know. I'll call in and make the report for you. You will make a report for me? Oh, Billy, Billy. You are a wonderful girl. <laughs> I watch, I tell you, then you call in and make my phone call nice and plain. <laughs> that way, I help, I do my part. I be real American. <laughs> real American. Da, I be observer too. Observer. <laughs> Obstacles such as these, and more than we can tell you about, have constantly befallen Roosevelt Post. Still, the diligent little community has met and conquered each barrier. It is doing its noble part to help warn the nation of the possible approach of the enemy by air. Each week, in cooperation with the Army Air Corps 4th Fighter Command, we present the beautiful Eyes Aloft Gold Trophy Award to some observation post or filter center for outstanding service performed. Here in our Hollywood studios, Captain Russell Z. Smith, ground observation officer of the Southern California region, will now make the award. Captain Smith. This week, we present the National Broadcasting Company's Eyes Aloft Gold Trophy Award to the Roosevelt, California Post for keeping that post in operation day and night as an integral unit of our national defense. At the conclusion of this broadcast, the Eyes Aloft Gold Trophy Award will be rushed from this studio by Army Messenger to the community of Roosevelt, California. The handsome award will stand in the little green sedan post at the crossroads to remind all who have served that America will win. Gain Whitman bidding the 150,000 aircraft warning service workers good night. Next week at this same hour, tune in again for another thrilling human interest broadcast of Eyes Aloft. Perhaps you'll hear your story or the story of your post or filter center dramatized on the air. Next week, our guest will be Major Henry Thorne, the last man to fly out of Bataan. Eyes Aloft is written and produced by Robert L. Redd. Original music is composed and conducted by Gordon Jenkins. This is Ken Carpenter charging you to always remember... Eyes Aloft! Eyes aloft, watching the sky, watching for planes flying the lanes up above. Eyes aloft, always on guard, lending a hand for taking.
This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.